continue to build behind our plan to deliver massive tax relief and job creation for the American people. The House passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and the Senate Finance Committee passed its companion tax reform bill. These were important moments as we move closer to a final vote. In recent months, we've heard from American entrepreneurs, workers, and families from every corner of our nation about how this plan will empower them to build a better life. In Pennsylvania, Susie Shulman said that our plan will be, quote, incredible for me and other fixed income retirees, end quote, because tax relief is targeted at the middle class. In Ohio, Christina Port, a small business owner who raised twins as a single mother while launching her company, said the increase in the child tax credit would help working mothers. She also said simplifying the complex tax code would ease the burden on entrepreneurs and allow them to devote more of their time to growing their business rather than wrestling with their taxes. In state after state, story after story, we've heard how our plan will profoundly improve the lives of hardworking Americans. The optimism is coming back because with this tax plan, combined with the President's efforts to eliminate job-killing regulations, Americans feel like their goals are once again attainable. It's a reminder of one of the things that made our country unique to begin with. Our people have always been able to visualize a future for themselves and their children and make it a reality. That's why it's called the American Dream, and this tax plan will make it more attainable for more of our people than ever before. But for this to happen, we need economic growth that makes it possible for businesses to create jobs and raise wages. So to give some perspective on how our tax plan is going to do that, I've invited Kevin Hassett, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, to join us in the briefing today. Kevin will say a few words and then take some questions uh, specific to this topic. And as always, I will come back up to take uh, the rest of your questions after that, which I'm sure will all be on tax reform. So with, <laughs> yes, with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, and it's a pleasure to be here to see so many uh, familiar faces. You know, last week uh, I had the honor of chairing the Economic Policy Committee meeting at the OECD in Paris, and uh, the Economic Policy Committee is one of the oldest committees at OECD, and it brings together people like the Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors from countries around the OECD. And at the meeting, uh, they were going through the staff recommendations of the OECD for creating economic growth in countries around the world. And the three main points of the staff recommendations were tax reform, uh, infrastructure, and deregulation, that if, uh, if the government pursues those things, then they can produce more economic growth. In fact, uh, there was widespread acclaim uh, for the President's approach towards corporate taxation in particular because the OECD has been calling for us to reform our corporate tax code for almost a decade. And so uh, the idea right now uh, that this corporate tax reform is close to the finish line is celebrated not only by us in the White House, but by people around the world who have recognized that us having a non-competitive tax code, the highest corporate tax on earth, a worldwide system that rewards companies for locating activity elsewhere uh, is bad not only for us but for the world economy because a vibrant U.S. economy is good even for, for our friends in the OECD. And with that, I'm uh, you know, pleased to see that uh, the House Ways and Means Committee and then the House have passed this bill that it's out of the Finance Committee and look forward to the Senate moving forward right after the Thanksgiving break. And I guess I, I promise, I, I'm not good at this, I don't know what the protocol is, but I'll start in the front row and then work back. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm just an economist. <laughs> uh, Kevin, I know you're an economist, but there's obviously a political component to, to all of this. You've got at least six senators up on the Hill, including Ron Johnson, saying that they can't support the bill in its current form or they have serious concerns mm -hmm. about it. You can only afford to lose two. Mm -hmm. Are you confident that you can get this passed through the Senate, or could the President run into another situation like he did with Obamacare, that he wins the House and then loses everything in the Senate? Well, well you know, there's an old joke about economists that there are three types, those who can count and those who can't. Uh, and it takes a while for that one to sink in. Uh, and uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, the President has supported from the beginning regular order because he doesn't think that we have to wait until the thing becomes law to learn what's in it, that the right thing to do is to expose the bills to scrutiny and debate. And Senator Johnson, I, I met with him yesterday in his office, has some serious concerns, and it's appropriate at this point in the legislative process to bring those forward. And, and you know, I'm hopeful that people can work it out and that, that everybody, even Democrats, will end up wanting to vote for it. And, and so, so I'm, I'm not sure about the etiquette for, for well, follow-up, so, 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 so I'll, I'll try to limit people to one because there's a lot of hands. Uh, Trickle-down economics is going to work this time when it hasn't worked before. 
Uh, so, so trickle-down economics is uh, something that, you know, I guess, people who criticize the idea that taxes affect the economy uh, will use to characterize approaches like the one that we're pursuing. Uh, but I don't think that uh, the idea that's, you know, celebrated by even the, you know, nonpartisan staff of the OECD that if you have lower marginal rates you get economic growth is voodoo economics or uh, controversial at all. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, I mean, the, fa the fact is that countries around the world have cut their corporate rates and had uh, broad-based reforms like we're doing on the individual side and then seen economic growth result. I don't think there's anybody who thinks that you'll get no growth or negative growth from this. Maybe there are a few people, but at every economic model I've seen, you get growth, either a lot of growth or sometimes uh, if it's a closed economy, closed economy model, a little growth. But you get positive growth out of this. And, and that growth uh, will benefit workers. And let's talk about that. So right now, the way a U.S. firm avoids U.S tax is they locate activity, say, at a country like Ireland uh, instead of here. And so if you build a plant in Ireland, then you can sell the stuff back into the U.S. And when you sell the stuff back into the U.S., then it increases the trade deficit and doesn't do anything for American workers. But it does increase the demand for Irish workers and drive up their wages. And so what the President wants to do is cut the rate to 20 percent and build guardrails around the uh, tax code so that people can't transfer price everything to Ireland anymore. And if we do that, then the people who benefit will be the workers here in the U.S. who have increased demand for their jobs. I, I said no follow-ups yeah. if we could help yeah. it. And, 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 so I'm going to go back this way, then I'm going to switch sides. So, so uh, yeah, I'm sorry I don't know everybody's name. Too. Well, one of Senator Johnson's concerns is that this bill does not do enough for medium-sized and small businesses. Can you talk about what the bill does, does do for medium-sized and small businesses? Sure. And, and, and the, the fact is that, that I, I want to remind everybody that the President has really uh, three main uh, non-negotiables for this bill, that there's a 20 percent corporate tax rate, that there's a big middle class tax cut, and that the bills simplify the tax code. And uh, we believe, after analyzing the progress on the Hill, that both approaches satisfy the three main objectives. And so the question then is, moving forward, uh, what do they do about pass-through entities? What do they do about this? What do they do about that? And we at the White House don't want to get ahead of that process. The President supports regular order because that's really how deals get made and how bills become law. The fact is it's urgent that we get a 20 percent rate for America's workers, and it's urgent that we get a middle class tax cut for America's workers. And the details about, like, exactly when the small business things kick in and out are things that we're watching them work out up on the Hill. And, and we encourage them to pursue regular order because they need to listen to everybody and get the votes they need to make this law. Uh, I'll go to the lady right there. I'm sorry. So and then the, I come this way. One of the major differences between the House and Senate bill is the um, elimination <coughs> of the non taxable tuition waivers. So while they're trying to reconcile their differences on that tax reform bill, what do you foresee which could potentially move this tax burden to a lot of young Americans? That That's the kind of detail that we're letting Congress work out. The, the fact is that they're finding the coalitions that they need to, to pass the bills in the House and the Senate. And we support that process. We support regular order. We support the transparency that's leading to debate about issues like this. Uh, and sorry, now I said I'd come over thank here. You. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kevin, thanks for being here. On one of your TV Honored appearances you. yesterday, you said that an average family, when this is all said and done, could accumulate a savings, a benefit of $4,000. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Can you walk us through that? <laughs> Sure. And uh, in uh, two, for those, those of you, uh, and I see some nerdy looking people out there, so I'm sure that there's people that want to do this, that, that uh, we've got two CEA reports that go through this in gory detail. And uh, the fact is that you can get to numbers like that four different ways. Uh, I won't try to do that now in the limited time that we have. Uh, but the basic idea is that back when we increased our corporate tax rate from 34 to 35 percent, we were kind of in the middle of the pack of OECD nations. Subsequently, what happened was the countries around the world found that when they cut the corporate tax, that their economic activity increased and the welfare of their workers improved. Uh, and then they very often did it again. A typical country, since our tax increases, cut its corporate rate two or maybe even three times. And for economists, what that does is it gives us an enormous amount of data to analyze because there are countries that change their rate and countries that don't. And you can compare the experiences of those two types of countries. There's a big peer-reviewed literature that looks at that, including a paper that's about to, by a German economist that's about to come out in the American Economic Review. And what we do is we go through all those papers and we have charts that show, well, if this paper is true, what wage effect do you get? And most of the action is, is well north of $4,000, and, and that, that's where the number comes from. Uh, I'll go in the middle with the orange tie. Uh, yeah, one of the criticisms, Kevin, of the tax reform proposal is that the corporate tax rate is cut permanently. The individual tax rate phases out 
after mm -hmm. 10 years. Why, in your view, is that such a good idea? So, so the president supports permanent uh, tax cuts for the middle class and permanent tax cuts for corporations, and that's certainly the objective of the planners of this tax bill. But there are also, but there are also, you know, Senate budget rules and reconciliation rules that are required to allow this bill to move th forward uh, with 51 votes. Of course, the hope for everybody is that that you know, when the time comes for these things to expire, that they get extended. As happened, you know, I might add, even for the top marginal rate. When President Obama came into office, and so they extended most of the Bush tax cuts, uh, but even the top rate at the beginning, uh, which interestingly they must have done because they knew that if you were to increase the top marginal tax rate during a recession, that it would be very harmful uh, for the economy. So back then, there was bipartisan support for the idea that you should not lift the top marginal rate, and so there should be bipartisan support. There'd be economic growth effects of, of bringing it down right now. I'll go back down into the middle there. Hi. Robinson, One American News. Mm -hmm. um, the two bills are different in that the House bill repeals or does away with the estate tax and the Senate doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that was a big point for the administration and Vice President Pence has voiced his support for repealing the death tax, mm -hmm. as they call it. What are your thoughts on that and do you think a final bill will include a repeal of it? I think that, that, again, that's one of the things that the Senate and the House are, are working out. Uh, I know that the President very strongly favors the elimination of the death tax, and uh, if that is in the final uh, bill, I'm sure that he'll be happy about that. But he's listed his non-negotiables, and those non-negotiables I cited at the beginning. Uh, I'll go back to the far back now. Hey, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about this moment earlier in the week at the Wall Street Journal event? Gary Cohn was on stage, uh, and the moderator asked a group of CEOs uh, if tax reform passes, who here is going to increase their investment? And only a couple of hands went up in the room. Uh, Gary Cohn said, why aren't there more hands going up? Can you answer that question? You know, why aren't there more hands going up in a room like that? Sure, you would so assume the CEOs would say, yes, in fact, we are going to invest more in tax reform passes. Is, is yeah. the, the administration missing something there? So, so, so that, that's a great question. And I went on a, a little bit after Gary Cohn. And when they asked that question, it was kind of hard for me because like here, they're really bright lights, but even brighter there. And so I couldn't quite see how many hands there were. But when I was there, it looked like maybe about half the hands went up. and. Uh, I think if you go back and look, uh, that it, it could be that people had time to think about it. But as an economist, if I go back and look at the academic literature, very often people survey CFOs and they say, hey, if we change the tax code, would you guys do anything? And they tend to always answer no in surveys. But if you look at the hard evidence about what they do, imagine if they didn't respond to taxes, then they wouldn't be pursuing their fiduciary duty to maximize profits for their shareholders. And so, so it would be totally irrational for them to do that. And firms that did act rationally in response to the tax code would put them out of business by taking advantage of the tax code. And, and so, so the point is the hard evidence is that people do respond. In fact, one of my very, very first papers that I ever wrote when I got out of grad school is in the Brookings Papers where we looked at the 1986 Tax Act, the changes that it made to the business tax code and how it affected investment, and there were very large effects. Uh, right here in the front. Yes, yes. Gene Sperling, who was once in your position in another administration, says that this tax plan, be it historic, costs $1.5 trillion. And it's a deficit hole. And he says, it basically, this is in a tweet, um, just paraphrasing his tweet, he says it basically doesn't justify that cost for 100 million households. Tax well, well, you know, I, I respect Gene a great deal and, and consider him a friend, and I disagree with him about that. And, and I'm sure we'll at some point have a point to a chance to talk about that. But, but here's the way I think about it, and what I would say to Gene if he was here: that if you look at the Joint Tax Committee score in the tenth year, they say that the tax bill costs about 170 billion dollars. If you look at the CBO projection of GDP, then in the 10th year, GDP is about $28 trillion. And so the amount of deficit that you're talking relative to GDP in the 10th year is only 0.6 percent. It doesn't take a heck of a lot of economic growth to cover that hole by the 10th year. And so the idea that, that right now we have the highest corporate tax on earth generating almost no revenue because people avoid the tax by moving factories to Ireland, that if we fix that, if we repair it and make the U.S. an attractive place again, that it's going to blow a hole in the deficit, it's just it's just not economically rational. And I know that the Joint Tax Committee score says what it says, and I respect the professionalism of that staff. But the fact is that, that the OECD has a study, which we'd be happy to email you, that says that the U.S. in the corporate tax space is on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, that we've got such a high corporate tax rate that we're chasing business offshore and losing revenue. And so the idea that this blows a hole in the deficit, I think, is just incorrect. I'll go to Purple Tie. John uh, right in front of me left off when he asked about the phase out on the individual side. 
you're an economist, however, you, the two answers that you gave were both political. One, there's <laughs> reconciliation rules, uh, and two, hopefully politicians down the line solve it. Mm -hmm. um, but like I mentioned, you're an economist, so can you not make an economic argument as to why this is good economically for people? Oh, is it good for things to expire? Correct. Uh, the is there an Good for the country as it stands right now to expire within eight years or so. If you lower marginal tax rates, broaden the base, lower rates, give the middle class a tax cut, if you cut the corporate rate, uh, if you do any of those things, they're positive for ex economic growth and they're less positive for growth if they expire. Expensing is kind of a strange thing in the sense that if you have expensing for a year, if you go back and look at U.S. history, very often in recessions, they'll put in expensing for a year to try to stimulate the economy. When expensing expires, it could actually actually have a short run stimulus because people try to buy capital before the thing goes away. But for the most part, uh, permanent tax cuts are, are, are far more impactful than things that expire, which is why if you go back and look at the Obama administration, when they were here during, during the beginning of the, of the Great Recession, they even extended the Bush tax cuts at the top uh, because they understood this. Um, right, can I go right here and then I'll come to you, Richard. And then that might be the last one because Sarah's standing up. I actually want to follow up on, on that. Okay, so sure. you all made a value judgment to make the corporate tax cuts permanent and make the individual tax cuts uh, expire, uh, even though you want all of them to be permanent. Um, what's, the, what's the rationale for having corporations have that certainty of knowing that they don't have to worry about what's going to happen in Washington while families are going to have to worry about what uh, politicians do six, seven years now? Sure, sure. Well, those are the kind of things that are being worked out by Congress in order to create a bill that under you know Senate and House rules can become law. And uh, the non-negotiables for us are both met in both bills, and we consider that good news. But but you know the, the the choices that the Senate has to make in order to acquire a coalition to make this law are, are choices that the Senate has to make, and, and we don't want to get in front of that process. The value, one way or the other, whether the corporate tax cuts. I, I think versus tax cuts that are permanent, of, of course, will have have larger positive effects. So I'll give you less. Uh, Kevin, yeah. you've melded politics and economics here quite successfully. And I want to ask you a political and economic question. You've talked about growth covering what the Congressional Budget Office and the Joint Tax Committee say could be a deficit hole, a deficit implication of one and a half billion dollars. That is going to be measurable over time. There's going to be a means by which either dynamic scoring or static scoring answers that question. And since it's on the mind of some of your undecided Republican senators, is this administration willing to commit to a review five years in to see if the growth models have, hold, have held along your lines and the deficit implications aren't as large, or if they aren't, to reassess these tax cuts in order not to blow a hole in the deficit. You know, uh, the, I have not discussed with the president, I don't think Sarah has, you know, what we're willing to commit to in terms of what we do five years from now. But I can talk, but, but let, me, let me talk about what, what we can uh, be clear about today, uh, which is that as the president came into office, uh, you know, the president's opponents were saying that 2 percent growth was inevitable, that we were uh, stuck in a secular stagnation, that the president's policies couldn't deliver 3 percent growth, and that, that it was a cockamamie idea to, to assert it. Uh, we've had two quarters in a row. Uh, of 3% growth. If you look at the fourth quarter data, it's suggesting at the Atlanta Fed they have GDP now, uh, which is about 3.2 as of yesterday. So it's saying that we're growing at 3%. If we take that momentum into next year and add a tax cut, then we're quite confident that one should be able to expect sustained uh, growth at that level or above. And uh, with that, I think I have to hand it back to Sarah. Thank you so much uh, for being gracious with your questions. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Major, he's right. I haven't spoken to the president about that, but I do appreciate uh, that you know that the president will still be here in five years. So uh, I like that vote of confidence that you would know that we will uh, be here to take that review and we'll be sure to raise that with him. We'll go back Hi, here. Thanks, Sarah. I have a non Roy Moore question for you. Um, uh, can you say definitively, I want to ask you about the Lebanese, Lebanese Prime Minister Hariri. Can you say definitively from this podium that he has been not, not been held hostage? by the Saudis, and does the President plan to speak to Prime Minister Hariri at all? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, anticipated conversations. That's something I'd have to check on and get back to you, and I don't have any further comment uh, beyond that at this point right now. And I would refer you to the State Department on specifics, though. Cecilia. Thanks, Sarah. If it's fair to investigate Al Franken uh, and the allegation made by his accuser, is it also fair to investigate this President and the allegations of sexual misconduct made 
against him by more than a dozen women. Look, I think that this was covered uh, pretty extensively during the campaign. Uh, we addressed that then. The American people, I think, spoke very loud and clear when they elected this president. But how is this different? Uh, I think in one case, specifically, uh, Senator Franken has admitted wrongdoing and the president hasn't. I think that's a very clear distinction, Major. So I want to revisit something we discussed yesterday. Uh, you said one of the ways that Alabama voters might be able to figure out if these allegations against Roy Moore are true is in the court of law. That's a direct quote from you. There's no criminal means by which that could happen. So are you suggesting that Roy Moore sued the accusers in order to hash this out in court? Uh, I mean, that would be something that I would refer to him to make that decision. That's not something I would be able to advise him on. When you talked about, I'm saying that was one. I said that's one option, one way to determine uh, that process. But that would be a decision that he would have to make. Certainly not one I'm going to make. Because during the campaign, as you well remember, then candidate Trump said after the election he would sue all the women who have accused him of sexual misconduct, and that you have from the podium deemed all liars. He hasn't done that. Why hasn't he done that? Uh, I haven't asked him that question. I'd have to ask him and let you know uh, why he hasn't chosen to take that path. I'm simply stating that's an option that Roy Moore has on the table. Jeff? Uh, there are some critics have said that it was hypocritical of the president to tweet about Al Franken and not weigh in on Roy Moore. He has weighed on Roy, on, on Roy Moore. He did it while he was on a foreign trip in Asia. I did it repeatedly yesterday. In fact, I took about 15 questions on that topic uh, and only one on Al Franken. So to suggest that this White House and specifically that this president hasn't weighed in uh, is just inaccurate and wrong. He weighed in. He said if the allegations are true, he should step aside. He also weighed in when he supported the RNC's decision to withdraw resources from the state of Alabama. Uh, it's just a simply uh, inaccurate statement to make about the president. Sarah. Um. Can you tell us whether the president believes the women who are making these allegations against Roy Moore, and would he be willing to ask the Alabama governor to delay the election or take a step like that to try to intervene uh, in this electoral process in Alabama? The president certainly finds the allegations extremely troubling, as I stated yesterday, uh, and he feels like it's up to the governor and the state, uh, the people in the state of Alabama to make a determination on whether or not they delay that election or whether or not they support and vote for Roy Moore. Matthew. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, in light of the national discussion about the importance of taking these kinds of accusations seriously, I wanted to check, is it still the White House position that all the women who have accused the president of sexual misconduct are lying? Uh, the president uh, has spoken about this uh, multiple times throughout the campaign and has denied uh, all of those allegations. Blake. Hey, sir, let me ask you about something else, the uh, pending potential AT&T and Time Warner merger. The president had said on the campaign trail back in October 2016, and I quote here, he said it was a deal we will not approve in my administration because it's too much concentration of power in the hands of too few. Does the president still, still feel that way? Uh, the president was asked about this uh, a few days ago, uh, maybe a week ago, while we were on Air Force One, and I'd refer you back to those comments. April. Sarah, is this an uncomfortable conversation about the sexual allegations for this White House, be it Al Franken or be it Roy Moore? I think it's an uncomfortable conversation for the country. Uh, I think that this is something that is being discussed pretty widely, and we certainly think that it should be taken very seriously. And it's one of the reasons I stand up here and answer your questions every day, uh, and will continue to do so and continue to address them. Um, obviously, it's something that should be looked at, and I think it should be looked at widespread, not just uh, in the political sphere, but in the business atmosphere uh, and across the board in this country, and something we certainly, again, take seriously. Alex, I'm, I'm going to we're Hillary tight Clinton. on time today. Hillary Clinton today. April. about the president's past and going back to what Matthew said. She said, look, I worry about everything from his past because it tells you how he behaves in the present and will in the future. What do you say to that as it relates to these allegations against the president? I think Hillary Clinton probably should have dealt with some of those of her own issues before addressing this president. Alex. Uh, two questions, one on taxes and immigration. A recent uh, Pinnacle University poll said 61% uh, of voters think the Republican tax plan will benefit the wealthy. Well, the White House has pitched uh, this plan as a working class tax cut. Why the disconnect? And then on immigration. Let me uh, answer that first question. Okay. Uh, look, 
we've, we've actually argued that this tax plan benefits all Americans. That's the point of it. Uh, specifically, in our priority is to target middle class Americans and make sure that that is addressed first and that those people uh, are prioritized in any piece of legislation first either the House or the Senate. Uh, but at the same time, we want all Americans to benefit by a growing economy and a tax system that actually works for our country versus one that penalizes people. We're going to keep moving just because we're tight. John? Let me come back and ask you the same thing that I asked Kevin. You've got six Republican senators either no or seriously on the fence here. Can you win enough over in order to pass this? And if the president gets snookered again by the Senate, what's his reaction to it? Uh, we certainly are still very confident that we're going to get this package passed, and we'd love to see some of the Democrats come on board and support this historic piece of legislation that we feel will be one of the uh, great legacies of this presidency. The fact that you didn't get any Democrats in the House, how does that pretend for getting them in the Senate? There's always hope. We'll uh, hold out hope that Democrats in the Senate uh, want to put partisan politics aside and put the people of this country first. Uh, we haven't ruled it out, and we're certainly going to keep pushing forward, and we're still confident we're going to get it done. It's safe to say the president will not be pleased if he gets snookered by the Senate again? Uh, I think the American people will be the ones that won't be pleased, because they're going to be the ones that lose out the most if this doesn't go forward. Salute. Thanks, Sarah. The uh, disaster funding request for about $44 billion today. Um, it's much less than what a number of different uh, governors and uh, officials in the various impacted uh, territories and states have requested. Can you explain sort of why the, the, the number is so low compared to what uh, the local officials say they need? I, I don't think $44 billion is a low amount. Um, and my guess is if you ask any average citizen across this country, they wouldn't feel like it's low either. Up until this point, Texas has not put any uh, state dollars into this process. We feel strongly that they should step up and play a role and work with the federal government. Uh, in this process, we did a thorough assessment, and that was completed, and this was the number that we put forward to Congress today. Much more requests forward in the future, uh, specifically for Puerto Rico. There, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, at this point, the request that went in today of the roughly $44 billion uh, primarily addresses Texas and Florida. Those storms took place ahead of Puerto Rico, and the assessment for Puerto Rico hasn't been completed yet. Once that's done, we fully anticipate that there will be additional requests at that time. Kristen? Sarah, thank you. Steve Bannon sending a strong message to the establishment to back off of Roy Moore. Is the President's allegiance to Steve Bannon in any way impacting his response? Uh, the President doesn't have an allegiance to Steve Bannon. The President has an allegiance to the people of this country and nothing else. Has he spoken at all to Steve Bannon or any Not outside advisors? Not that I'm aware of. How concerned is he, Sarah, about losing this seat to the Democratic <coughs> candidate who right now, according to the polls, is leading? Look, I, I think that the President is less concerned about the seat and more focused on uh, the policy and the legislation that we're pushing through right now, like tax reform. John? Thanks a lot, Sarah. Just uh, in regards to that uh, question regarding the supplemental request the President, the administration has put forward $44 billion. Puerto Rico has requested uh, $94 billion. Are they going to get somewhere along that order? I think half of the island is still without electricity. As I said, we're going to wait until that assessment is complete, and we'll make a determination at that point uh, and see what the best path forward is. Did the President notify Governor I'm sorry, Abbott, John, I'm going to keep the, moving. the President notify Governor Abbott uh, of the John, lesser I, amount I'm going to keep that, moving. that he's, uh, I'm going to that he's put forward? Try to be respectful of your colleagues. Go ahead. Uh, yesterday, uh, the joint uh, investigative mechanism uh, was vetoed by Russia at uh, the UN Security Council. And Ambassador Haley tweeted afterward that the veto proves that Russia cannot be trusted uh, as a partner going forward in trying to solve the political situation in Syria. Uh, does the President have any response to the veto first? Um, what is the U.S. view going forward of how chemical weapons uh, will be investigated and dealt with in Syria? And is it the U.S. <coughs> now that Russia cannot be a partner in trying to solve uh, or 
do a next day uh, political uh, situation. Uh, I think by the day. actions that the president's taken, uh, specific to chemical weapons, I think he's shown uh, his position on that with the uh, strike in Syria earlier this year. In terms of uh, Russia's veto, it's certainly not one we support. We do hope that moving forward, uh, they want to get on board and work with us on this. Um, but at the same time, this isn't something that we support their decision on. Stephen? There's been some extraordinary pushback on the administration's decisions with respect to uh, <coughs> elephant trophies and, and, and hunting of, of lions and elephants in Africa. Can you shed some light on the decisions the administration has made and what you make of pushback? Yeah, this is uh, actually uh, due to a review that started back in 2014 under the previous administration uh, done by career officials at the Fish and Wildlife Service. This review established that both uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe had met new standards, strict international conservation standards that allowed Americans to resume hunting in those countries. Uh, a ban on importing elephant ivory from all countries remains in place, but again, all of this was based on a study that was conducted uh, that started back to the previous administration and done by career officials. Darlene? The Senate tax bill has a, a tax break for corporate jets. How does that help the middle class? Uh, as Kevin stated before, this administration has laid out the priorities that we want to see reflected in this legislation. Uh, we're going to continue to fight for those priorities and let the legislative process work through uh, in terms of those specific pieces. That's something I would refer you uh, to members of the House and Senate on that. But our focus is on making sure these priorities are answered and met. We'll make this the last Thank one. You, Yesterday on Jared Kushner and those campaign emails, that Senate committee, um, they're asking for those emails in the Russia investigation. You punt it to the Kushner's attorney. Today, what's the White House reaction to those previously undisclosed emails? Look, that, uh, I, as I said, they were going to put out a statement. They did, and I would refer you back to that on uh, anything specific to that uh, inquiry. Thanks so much, guys. Hope you have a uh, happy Friday and a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Thanks, sir. Happy Friday and welcome to the briefing room here on ABC. It has been a long week, but hallelujah, we finally made it. I'm John Santucci alongside Megan Hughes and Arlette Sines on our White House team. Guys, this has been a very long week. There's been a lot that has happened, a lot rocking Washington this week, as we know, Remember both the, the elections. Yeah, I, I know. That, that, that happened Tuesday? Yeah. I'm pretty good. I got the day of the right week. Yeah. yeah, exactly after that. But, you know, we are all focused right now on what's happening up on Capitol Hill. Al Franken yesterday, obviously the ongoing battles over Roy Moore down in Alabama, and he's not going anywhere. And then how this all gets pulled in back to the president and the White House. And... I'm exhausted just talking about it. Arlette, you actually just showed me something before we came on here. So let, let's dive in first um, with uh, Roy Moore and the issues that are plaguing him. Uh, multiple women have come out. He has come out defiantly. His wife came out today. We'll get to that in a second. But members of Congress are still trying to block him. Oh, yeah. They're still, there. I mean, Leader McConnell has said on multiple occasions that he is unfit to serve in the Senate. And we know that they are actively seeking ways to try to figure out if there is a way that they could potentially block him. Uh, you know, one thing item that's been floated is potentially changing the date of this special election, right. asking the Alabama governor to do that. She has shown no inclination that she wants to do that. But people are nervous about having someone who has these types of accusations leveled against him, uh, having sexual misconduct, conduct, not with just with, with staffers, but with a minor, right. uh, that's a huge issue. And McConnell has said that if he does end up becoming a senator, that a, an ethics investigation is basically waiting there for him. So we're just have to ha have to see if there's anything that people can actually do uh, uh, to, to change the course of this at this and, point. And, and really right now it comes to the White House, right? And, and, and the lack of what has not been said. And I think we have it, but Ivanka Trump um, gave an interview earlier this week, spoke to the AP, and she said there was a special place in hell for anyone that does uh, actions like this to children. I haven't seen any valid explanation, and I have no reason to doubt the victim's accounts. But Megan, very different from her father. He is stuck around that word, if, if, if. I mean, Sandra Cecilia Vega has been popping out of bushes, trying to, <laughs> <laughs> really trying to nail the president down to just speak freely about mm. this, which really hasn't happened. Though, you know, as we heard from Sarah Sanders today, the president has weighed in. In fact, you know, with the with the statements that they have made, it's very clear that a lot of the 
brain power at the White House, a lot of the advisors mm -hmm. at the White House want to be talking about taxes. Right. They had the economy, you know, they rolled out a, a, a Council of Economic Advisors. Um, that's the way we started Kevin. off today. That's we how we started off today. So it's very, bit. it's very clear. This is right. they need a legislative victory. They believe they had one this this week in the House. They're looking for one in the Senate. They want the country to be rallying around mm -hmm. this tax push. Um, but the president himself made news this morning by tweeting about about Al Franken. Right, and I mean just just to go back to what Sarah said about this issue about uh, Roy Moore, is that she said it's inaccurate. We've weighed in. He uh, agreed with supporting the RNC pulling out, um, but it's up to the government and the state. We know that down there in Alabama, um, the state party has said they're not going to remove him. The governor is not going to stop it, not going to do anything with a special yes. election, making Luther get out of there. Nothing's going to change. But going back to Al Franken now, because that's the one everyone's talking right. about. So, Including the president. Right. That tweet last night, where did that come from? Because everybody thought that he was going to stay away from this, yet all of a sudden, 1030 last night, he dove headfirst into that battle. And he really was willing to, to rush into that. And, and some people have noted that there's a bit of hypocrisy in the fact that he's not directly weighing in or answering questions when it comes to Roy Moore. But then he freely uh, went and called Al Franken, Al Frankenstein, and, and talked specifically about that photo that showed Al Franken apparently groping a woman while she was I think we have asleep. that photo, too, just because uh, that's know, something we're talking about. But that's, I mean, that's probably one of the most striking um, Items that's come out of Leanne Tweeden's uh, account right. is that photo that, yeah, you can see that now uh, on air. But it also raises questions about the president's own accusation, the accusations that have been leveled against him throughout the right. campaign, and, and whether this is going to maybe bring up uh, more of those accusations or, or talk of them, and if he's ever going to be forced to, to, to react to that. And, and Megan, we, we were talking about that before we went on air. You know, the fact that um, he had multiple women come out and make public accusations against him, upwards of 10. Um, the president said throughout the campaign that he would sue these women. Sarah Sanders was asked about that, why he never did it. Said I haven't spoken to him about that, but that was a big part of the campaign. It, it was, and she liked to say repeatedly today that we've covered that ground. Let me turn that is old. That is old news. Right, right. Well, let me go to someone who's actually, as you said, hiding in bushes, jumping out of trees. <laughs> Cecilia Vega, our senior White House Wait. correspondent. You, you've me been Sean asking. Spicer. <laughs> <laughs> you've been Where asking the president Too about. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. It's okay. Um, but you've been asking the president, Cecilia, about Roy Moore. He dodged you um, when he came back from his trip, when he gave that statement, the water bottle, we're not going to talk about it. Um, and then on Capitol Hill yesterday, you tried again. He did not want to go near Roy Moore, Cecilia, but he dove headfirst for Al Franken. Yeah, and I don't know that the White House can get away with saying that the president has spoken about Roy Moore because the question that was explicitly asked of him when he was on Air Force One was to comment on Roy Moore. And he said, I don't know enough about that story. I will comment on it when I get home. He is home. He is home. He has been home. He has still not commented on it. The fact that Sarah Sanders is doing it from the podium, I don't think is going to be sufficient for uh, very much of the American public. Look, we are in the middle of a pivotal moment in our country when it comes to power, when it comes to women, when it comes to sexual harassment. The list goes on and on and on. And we have yet to hear not just from President Trump on Roy Moore. Uh, we have not hear, heard from him on this important issue facing our country to, to talk about his views on this. And, and you guys know the reason why. You're talking about it right now. This is a topic that is politically impossible for President Trump to dive into because he has a long list of his own accusers, accusations which he has adamantly denied. But nonetheless, anytime this comes up, this is going to be the question for him now. And I have to say, guys, much of this going forward, this political problem that he is now facing has been brought on him upon himself, this tweet, this Al Franken tweet. I mean, he went there. And I think a lot of aides here have to privately be scratching their heads going, you're making this so much worse. If you weren't going to talk about Al Mo uh, uh, Roy Moore, don't talk about Al Franken. Just don't talk about it at all for as long as you possibly can. And now here we are again. The, this briefing today was dominated, as you guys know, by questions about uh, sexual assault. Even the allegations this president has faced, the very last thing they want to be talking about as they're trying to get, as they said today, tax reform across the pin, uh, the finish line. No, and, and, and to your point, Cecilia, I mean, you, you and I were both talking yesterday. We said that we did not think he would go near this. Foolish us, but we took a bet on him not doing something because 
There he went and did it last night about 10.30. But now we're moving on to the Capitol, right? And the fact that um, obviously of the president here accused of things, you have a sitting United States senator accused. You know, now has been this question, is this, uh, you know, are there more to come? We know that Jackie Spear, who was leading this charge on Capitol Hill, said there are two sitting members of Congress that are accused of this. I mean, this yeah. certainly feels like the floodgates that ran through Hollywood are very quickly making their way to Washington, D.C. From Hollywood to, to D.C., it's not just making its way here, John, it's, it's here already. And all of us, I think, in this city are uh, just waiting to find out uh, who the other names are. I mean, Jackie Spears said there are two members uh, whose names have not been released who are accused of harassing uh, aides on, on Capitol Hill. I, I think um, that that is a story that is all part of a story here at this White House. But the problem for this White House right now is we're not just talking about these claims of sexual misconduct on Capitol Hill. We are not talking about allegations involving this president. That was not going to be part of this conversation last week uh, when this was Harvey Weinstein. That probably wouldn't have been part of this conversation very much if this was Roy Moore, but because of this Al Franken tweet, because he went there, this is very much part of the conversation right now. He does a lot of harm to himself by having done that last night. Cecilia Vega, our senior White House correspondent, will have seen much more from you tonight. We're going to let you go. You know, you got to run for World News tonight with David Muir. We'll talk to you shortly. Uh, have Thank a good you, weekend, Cecilia. guys. Thank you. You too. Yeah. So back here um, in the bureau, Megan Hughes and Arlette Signs, you're just joining us. This is the briefing room on ABC. Um, you know, just to quickly tie this all together, guys. Um, you know, you cover the Capitol for a long time, so. Just walk us through quickly here what happens, because now this becomes its House ethics to a degree, but it's also this other committee, the House Administrative Committee. That okay, so there's this, a right? few investigations right, well. and committees involved. Uh, first this is where I shut up and you tell us what we're doing. <laughs> first off, you have both Leader McConnell, uh, uh, Democratic leader, Senator Schumer, uh, and other, a lot of Democrats, and even Al Franken welcoming a Senate ethics investigation. So at this point, we're waiting to hear from the Senate Ethics Committee whether or not they're going to go ahead and launch a preliminary inquiry. I was talking to a former chief counsel uh, for the committee yesterday, and one big question that a lot of people had is can they even ha look into, do they have the jurisdiction to look into things that happened before someone joined the Senate? And that chief counsel told me they actually do, that oh, wow. they have a lot of leeway about the time periods that they can cover. So it does look like very likely that Senate Ethics will be uh, conducting an inv investigation or preliminary inquiry at, at least into Franken and this allegation and if any other allegations uh, come up. And so we'll kind of have to see. That could take a few months, it, yeah. weeks. It, it, it'll be a, a matter of time. But then there's also this question that I know our colleague Ben Siegel, he's sitting around here somewhere, has been looking into a little bit. But there's the uh, Office of Compliance over that deals with uh, allegations and claims that are made it's in the House and Senate. It's as if he heard you. He just walked right, right in. It's like I snap that? my fingers and Ben shows up. <laughs> <It'll go laughs> But you can actually, staffers can actually file claims uh, with this office. It's not just sexual harassment. It's also uh, racial discrimination or, or, or other uh, misconduct. And Ben, can you kind of walk us through how that works for folks? Yeah, so it's, it's right now it's a, it's a, it's a multi-step process. Um, you know, there have been several members of Congress, Jackie Spear, for example, have, have said that this is a process is too onerous. It puts too much of the burden on the victims of sexual harassment. Um, and without getting too far into the weeds, uh, they want to reform that. They want to take some of these restrictions away. They want to give power back to some of these victims. And they also want to put the burden on, let's say, members of Congress who are, who are guilty of harassment. They want them to pay back taxpayers for, for any sort of claims that, that they have to end up paying. And we know that there was this fund of about $15.5 million. Some of that may have gone to settle claims like that. It could have been for other things, too. But nevertheless, right. it, it was still taxpayer monies that we're going to deal with these indiscretions by members of Congress. That's right, and, and, and the people we talk to on the Hill say that most of that money is not going to settle sexual harassment claims, but there's no right. doubt that you know, this doesn't look good for members of Congress who very often, they, they pass the rules, they make the rules that we all play by, but they very often give themselves a different set of rules. So now we might see that change. Wow, now since, since uh, Ar Arlette you know, said your name and you just appeared, um, <laughs> you have a couple other things going on on Capitol yeah, Hill. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of other stuff. Yeah, a couple on. little things. So uh, let's talk taxes quickly. Sure. Where are we? we? We know the House passed it. They had that big celebration. That's right. We've kind of been there before with health care yeah. and nothing else happens. So That's how right. does this one work? Well, they didn't, they didn't go to the Rose Garden to celebrate no. prematurely this no. time. But no. uh, it was a big day yesterday for the House where Paul Ryan, especially, who's kind of staked his career 
on this on this tax overhaul. They had a big vote yesterday. Only 13 Republicans voted against the bill. The Senate now has to pass their version of the tax bill uh, when they get back from Thanksgiving in about in about a week, two weeks. And uh, and after that, the House and the Senate Republicans have to work to reconcile their two measures. There are some very significant differences between both, but right. the goal is to still get this done by the end of the year. And is that remotely realistic kind of realistic definitely realistic i mean where are we on the reality scale of that happening? they if, if you if you talk to top republicans on the hill they would say that they're on schedule for themselves but you know very often there are fights around the corner that come in with government funding there's you know talk about something going on with immigration that's a brewing political right. storm so we'll there, see if there could be a tweet that derails there could be a tweet I mean, there know, could be harassment stuff possible. so you know anything happens on the hill all right ben siegel we're not going to let you go but pulling this back to our white house team here the president needs a hit. He said, Megan, this was going to be a Christmas present. He was going to have this big thing. He told John Carl he'll be in the front row. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. And you know, I um, I covered the the markup on the, yeah. on, on the Senate side uh, this week. And if you needed any evidence of how toxic the partisanship is right now on Capitol Hill, it was actually a good watch. Yeah. I mean, you got, I mean, there was there were screaming matches. There right were there? screaming yeah, matches. Yeah. You heard Orrin Hatch, the chairman of the committee, for days telling everyone to stop screaming. Right. Let's restore civility. At the end. He started screaming wow. at Senator Brown, um, saying, you know, I was raised in a lower middle income family. Yeah. You know, these attacks saying that we're Republicans are just looking out for the rich here. Um, and then Democrats are furious that the individual mandate is now in play. And I mean, I think one of the, the X factors is what we see from the Affordable Care Act advocates right. mm -hmm. who have mobilized again and again and again. And this was pretty late in the game. And I think we're going to see some things happen when uh, members go home. Yeah, and definitely a lot of things when they come back, a short window to work on. Um, you know, we're going to be diving into this on Sunday this week with George Stephanopoulos. Has Senator Susan Collins remain a key Republican um, on this issue? Very big in the health care debate, very big in the tax reform date. She's live with George one-on-one -on -one Sunday morning here on ABC. Um, and the last thing, I had to plug something else because Megan threatened my life if I didn't. <laughs> the Powerhouse Politics Podcast. Did I get that all right? That's right. Okay. This was a pretty interesting episode. Just talk about that real quick. Yeah, right? and it was, it was different for us. So we profiled three faces of the Trump resistance. So three of the winners um, from from the recent election. Some, some interesting voices, that, refreshing uh, voices that we haven't heard in Washington, it's very a lot of civility. Yeah, I just mentioned some toxic partisanship. A lot of civility towards uh, the president and their opponents. Go online, go onto the podcast, download it. That'll be a good episode. Thank you for that. Thank you for the now I won't get in trouble. Thanks very much for joining us in the briefing room for Megan Hughes, Arlette Signs, Ben Siegel, Cecilia Vega. Everybody played today. I'm John Santucci. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.